uh, very nice to have the opportunity here to give you a brief update, pretty high level, um, uh, given the time of where the cell-based meat is. And uh, well, let me say what's going to keep us busy in the in the years ahead of us. Um, yeah, so most of us uh, love meat. Uh, it's been referred to earlier. Uh, um, I guess most of us love meat. It's sort of wired in our brain, and it makes some sense because it, you know, it's a great source of very densely packed nutrients, uh, but there are some serious downsides. Um, the use of resources, again, uh, are yet to mention this as well, is, is not very favorable. Uh, there are issues related to global warming, to, to uh, more environmental uh, uh, things like uh, the reduction of biodiversity, and they are all pretty serious and they're going to get worse uh, because again, there's going to be more of us, we're going to be richer, so we're going to afford to buy and consume more meat. And basically it's not the consumption per se of meat that is the issue, but it's the scale at which we consume it. This is, this is actually getting out of hand. So, um, yeah, we can simply reduce our intake uh, by becoming, for instance, a flexitarian, simply eat less meat, which in, in most, if not all, of the established economies would do very well from a nutritional point of view, as I'm sure you all know. But yeah, unfortunately, unfortunately, that's not all when it comes to, uh, to meat. It's a special product uh, with a special attraction. Or we can try to hang on to the experience by eating plant-based products, uh, which nicely uh, follows up on the previous presentations that, you know, try to mimic the meatiness, try to mimic the experience of meat. Or we can continue to produce and consume it, but in a way that has, well, none of those downsides, basically. At least that is the promise of cultured meat, because that's, as you will probably uh, expect, is what I'm going towards. Real meat grown outside of the body under controlled conditions. The, uh, the developers of, of cultured meat or clean meat or cultivated meat, it comes under many names. Uh, the more people think about what to call it, the more names you will see circulate all over the globe. But anyway, the developers, roughly 50 in the world today, companies are on all sorts of different tracks. It's not like there's one um, core technology for, for cultured meat. There are many ways to, to approach this technology. What they have in common though is that they all start with a few cells which then undergo proliferation, turn into a lot of cells, and in a final stage these cells are uh, driven to differentiate into, into tissue, which can be fat tissue, it can be muscle tissue, um, it can even be skin. Um, the species vary between various companies, um, pork, beef, it's all of fish, it's all over the place, and some of them use genetic modification, some don't. So th there are various approaches, let's say upstream here, and more downstream, uh, you see the same when it comes to applications. There are uh, uh, companies working on several models. None of them you will see in the market, by the way. So this is sort of a little bit mix of insider information with educated guesses. Um, so some of them um, use tissue or even only cells, individual cells, which cannot consider to be tissue, to spike ex existing plant-based products uh, to give them more meatiness, whatever that is, but that's, that's an approach that some of them take. Some of them work on a new standard, like this example, which is a product that resembles a steak, but it's actually beef cells and beef tissue, uh, which you could argue is a steak, but then grown on a scaffold or in a scaffold of soy. So a hybrid product. Or you can go all the way and you know work towards meat that is biologically as close to traditional meat as possible, preferably spot on. It's all possible. Like I said, a few dozen companies are, are working on this um, of various sizes. So where's the field today? Well, typically you work your way from lab scale to pilot scale, sort of what's, what's you know, uh, uh, picturized here, I guess, um, onwards to the industrial scale. And most, if not all of the companies out there are sort of in the pilot stage, working on scaling the technology, mastering the basic biology pretty far, pretty to a pretty high extent, but still with iterations coming from the lab side while preparing for industrial scale activities. It's a bit of both, and that's what you see in the more advanced companies out there as the stage that they are uh, uh, in. 
And in terms of predicted timing, um, the first products will probably come to the market in 2022, 2023, and probably in the US or Southeast Asia or maybe even Israel, probably not in the EU for the first time, um, as the first market, that is, um, because of the pretty lengthy and, and somewhat unpredictable novel food procedure that's, uh, that's uh, applicable to you know, being able to introduce in the, in the EU. Um, so now that companies are more and more sort of grasping the fundamental biology of the cells going forward, um, there are a couple of main interests um, that they are all working on. And this includes my company. And by the way, I'm keeping this very generic. It's not really a company presentation. It's more sort of a, a picture of the field. First of all, they need to create a very cheap source of cell food, including a bunch of, of, of um, low dosage, but extremely expensive stimulants that are needed. So the food needs to become extremely cheap. Then we need to gain so much, um, yeah, let's say understanding of the metabolism um, of those cells in every stage of the process, process that the nutrient conditions can be optimized way more than they can, for instance, in the traditional farming uh, uh, industry. And, and the waste can also be optimized slash removed. So this is about conversion. This is about converting the media in, an, in the most optical, optimal way in, in, in tissue, ultimately in, in meat. And um, it's about a third important area. It's about developing or, or adopting existing hardware and optimizing process conditions in a way that the investments in production capacity, well, actually have a payback. I mean, you can produce an extremely cheap cell food, which you can then in an extremely efficient way turn into tissue, i.e. meat. But if you still need to invest vast amounts of money to do that, on the hardware side, you still don't have a process that has uh, any chance of survival. So uh, there needs to be a return on the investment. The process needs to have a, cer a certain output. That's, that's what all these companies are working on. In terms of activities, this means that the field is uh, working its way from, a, let's say, pharmaceutical grade uh, growth media that is commonly used for, uh, for uh, cell culturing experiments to a more food level approach. Um, and ultimately even a more of a feed approach to the growth media that is given to the cells. The supply chain that produces vast amounts of growth media needs to be developed and grown. And the supply chain essentially does not exist yet today. Then huge amounts of data will be gathered from uh, analyses of culture conditions and they need to be uh, they need to be uh, computed, um, they need to be turned into information in a way that leads to a feeding strategy that works. This is about the recycling. So the recycling is a lot about learning the biology, mixing that with uh, computational science. That's a field that heavily steps into this. And thirdly, the output needs to grow to an industrial scale. An important factor here is the density of the cells that you can grow in a bioreactor. And mammalian cells are very, very picky. So this, this, is, a, this is a big field of research. The higher it is, the higher it, the output is. And the longer the cells can continue to grow, um, the more cells you will have in your bioreactor and the larger the size of the bioreactor can ultimately be. And large bioreactors are obviously related to a lower production price. But also the, the, the reactors must be void of anything any complexity that is unnecessary. They need to be one trick ponies, quite contrary to the pretty versatile and, and complex bioreactors that you can buy uh, off the shelf. So the promise of the technology is huge. huge. It can eradicate anim animal suffering. It can contribute pretty, pretty much to uh, the fight against, well, global warming. It can improve biodiversity and more generally environmental conditions in, in sensitive areas of the planet. And it can avoid a future where, um, let's say the demand of meat physically cannot be met by just one planet. planet. If you do the math and you, and you look at like 2040, 2050, it's actually even, even if you wanted to, it's going to be hard to produce the demand of meat that's expected to be there by that time. And finally, it can also contribute to human health, human well-being. 
for various reasons. There are no more concentrations of animals in, in, in high concentrations of animals, as we all know, they are there today they're, and they're also in close contact with humans, which today leads to, a, well, an increasing range of zoonoses and in sort of in the same realm, there is no more introduction of gut bacteria through slaughtering processes into the human food chain uh, because there simply is no slaughtering process to begin with. There's virtually no use of antibiotics, so that eliminates an important contributor to the emergence of pathogenic antibiotic resistance microorganisms, which is you know, the widespread use of them in, in, in industrial farming. And inter interestingly, maybe more for the future, um, although we are already doing some work in that area, there is an opportunity more so than there would be in an animal to tune the composition of the meat in a favorable way. For instance, by reducing the, uh, uh, the amount of uh, saturated fatty acids and by tuning the, the fatty acid composition in a certain direction. So, um, so yeah, the promise is huge and uh, trust me, it's coming. And just to finalize, this final slide um, doesn't really have to do with the content, it's just to illustrate where we came from. Um, in the 90s, this guy, Willem van Ehle, a Dutch guy, wasn't the first to have the idea of cultured meat that was actually much older, but he was the first to take action, to see the opportunity and to do something. And his commitment, his persuasive power, if you like, his energy, did, did, all that is the reason that this field exists today. And um, mind you, when the cultured meat research started at a very, very low scale, um, roughly 20 years ago, he was 80 years old. So that's uh, quite a way to spend your uh, pension. And above all, it's imagination that makes the difference. The ability to look beyond, let's say, the obvious and probably many hurdles that are there um, when developing such a technology and to see a future where this becomes a reality. So. My takeaway message here is that big and meaningful innovation, it doesn't come from corporates, so it doesn't come from, from processes, it, it comes from people. Thank you.